Hello and welcome to Unit 1, The Language of Visual Experience, Lesson 3, The Visual Elements. In this lesson you'll be introduced to the elements of art. These elements are the vocabulary of art and the terms used to describe works of art. They can be employed to analyze and describe anything from a realistic painting to a non-representational sculpture. The objectives for this lesson are to describe the visual elements used in the production and analysis of art, indicate how artists use visual elements to create optical and illusionistic effect, explain technical devices used to render space and volume in painting, discuss the physical properties and relationships of color, show how visual elements convey expressive and symbolic meaning in a work of art, and use the basic tools of visual analysis to explain a work of art. Topics we'll be covering in this lesson are line, characteristics of line, implied line, shape, mass, mass in three dimensions, mass in two dimensions, space, space in three dimensions, space in two dimensions, implied depth, linear perspective, atmospheric perspective, time and motion, the passage of time, implied motion, actual motion, light, seeing light, implied light, light as a medium, color, the physics of color, pigments and light, the color wheel, color schemes, and texture. Lesson three is actually the largest one of the entire course and therefore it's going to have a lot of vocabulary in it. There are a total of 52 vocabulary words for lesson three. So far in the last two lessons we've gone over some of the possibilities of what art can be and the reasons of why people make art and how it functions in our lives. In lesson three, the visual elements, we're starting looking at works of art in more of a technical fashion. This image is the first in your text and going over the visual elements. It's by Daniel Richter from 2011. Uh, the most important thing I think about the way your text approaches this image is that it uses all the visual elements, line, shape, mass, space, time, motion, light, color, and texture to define this work of art. And they do a really good job at getting their point across. So please make sure that you review it in your text. The first element we're going to be looking at is line. I'm sure for most of you, when you think of line, you think of the line that you would draw on a piece of paper, or the lines on a note paper, or maybe even the line that you stand in, which is kind of an abstract concept. But I'd like you to throw all of your preconceived notions of what a line is out the window for this course. And as we look at this image from Lee Friedlander, we can see lines in many forms in this photograph. In the upper left, we have the actual phone lines. The telephone poles are also representative lines. We look to the left side of the photograph. We have the trim on the truck that's on the side. That's also a line. The line of the staircase with the uh, rail on the side. The lines of the guards, that you know, the ones on the side of the road that you usually have to protect your car. The bumper types. The large telephone pole. The shadows on the walls. Those are all lines. So you can try to think a little bit differently from now on. The line's just not what is there on paper. Lines are also, as we're going to see soon, uh, where certain objects meet, where certain divisions of areas that form one shade or another, and that difference forms a line as well. To further delve into line itself, we're going to now go over the characteristics of line. So first we have an actual line. This is pretty much you would consider would happen when you draw a line on paper. Here we have implied line. There is no physical line on this paper. There are a series of dots that are in a curve that give us an implied line. In this example, we have actual straight lines that form an implied curved line, where you see the darker areas on the bottom, and you have the wider area on top, and where they meet, you have an implied curved line. Here again, we have no physical line, but we have a line created by an edge where the black area and the white area meet to create the wavy line. Here we have two different line variations. We've got our vertical line, which is an attitude of alert attention, and a horizontal line, which is an attitude of rest. 
Diagonal lines can add a sense of motion or direction in an artwork. Here we have slow and fast action diagonal lines. Here we have sharp, jagged line. This can represent something like broken glass or electricity even. Here we have some intertwining or dancing of curving lines. These can represent motion, energy, or action in an artwork. Here we have two variations of line. On the left we have a hard line and on the right we have a soft line. Depending on your technique, your soft line can be made with charcoal or graphite that's been smudged with a smudge stick. You can also achieve this with paint, watercolor, many different methods and also on the computer. And for the last of our line variations we have here a ragged irregular line. This can be achieved by using charcoal on a rough piece of paper or taking your pencil, lifting it, and changing it to the point where it meets the paper as you drag it across. This slide is a contrast comparison of two variations of line art drawings. On our left we have Movement of Colored Lines from 1994 by Sophie Teuber Arp. And on our right we have an untitled drawing from around 1920 by Alexander Rochenko. Both of these images use some of the characteristics of line that we just looked at. The image on the left has curving, dancing, wavy lines as we've seen before. And on our right we have more angular, jagged lines. Here's an image to expand your view. Continuing with looking at line in a different light is this untitled work by Fred Sandback from 1977 and 2008 where he took black acrylic yarn in a three-dimensional space and created rectangular line art. In this print from Kiki Smith, Ginger from 2000, she used all sorts of different printmaking techniques to get all these fine lines to represent the fur. Uh, we have etching, aqua tinning, and dry pointing, uh, which is a type of engraving method on a metal plate. We'll be going over that in our printmaking section. Here we have a transitional image that will lead us into our next element, that is shape. In Eye in the Village from Marc Chagall, he used implied line to define geometric shapes. The shapes are pretty easy to recognize, but we're going to look at a line study next to break it down. When we look at this line study of Eye in the Village, we can see the hidden geometry underneath the painting. This is a common element in many of Chagall's works. The next element of art we'll be looking at is shape. Shape in the context of visual arts is the expanse within the outline of a two-dimensional area or within the outer boundaries of a three-dimensional object. We will be going over two different types of shapes, geometric, which are mainly circles, triangles, and squares, and variations thereof, and organic shapes, which are usually curved or irregular shapes. Most shapes in nature are organic, but we do have a few exceptions like crystals and snowflakes, which have geometric patterns. Organic shapes can also be referred to as biomorphic shapes. The flat picture surface is called the picture plane. You can look at this as a window or a snapshot into the image. When you put a shape on a picture plane, it automatically creates a secondary shape out of the background area. The dominant shapes on a picture plane are referred to as figures or positive shapes. Your background areas are your ground or your negative shapes. I'm sure some of you have seen an image by this famous printmaker before. This is Sky and Water number 1 from 1938 by M.C. Escher. What Escher did in this work is what is called a figure ground reversal. As we move from top to bottom, we can see the dark figures at the top blend in with the white figures on the bottom at the center. Thus we have the black figures which are normally our positive 
slowly become the negative shape in the background as the fish, which were actually the negative space on top, become the positive on the bottom. In this painting by Katarina Gross, untitled from 2010, we have a more subtle approach to the relationships between positive and negative spaces in a painting. You can kind of see these dominating areas of white and these stenciled areas of paint that you put on top by, by having the overspray of the lines dripping down from the paint intrude into the white space we have somewhat of a spatial confusion to say which keeps a surface like this active and will keep the viewer engaged. The next element is mass. We'll be looking at mass in three dimensions and mass in two dimensions. Shape, our last element, is a two-dimensional area. A three-dimensional area is called a mass, which is the physical bulk of a solid body of material. And when mass encloses space, the space is called volume. Frank Botero's The Horse from 2008 is an example of mass in three dimensions. Now, this is also something that is referred to as a closed form, which means that the sculpture does not overtly interact with the space that surrounds it. This bronze sculpture by Alberto Giacometti has less mass, but is more like a linear form. And also, since the figure has the arms pointing outward, protruding from the surface, this is what we call an open form. This linoleum cut print titled Bread by Elizabeth Catlett is an example of mass in two dimensions. The artist used lines that follow the curvature of the body to give us the sense that the figure has mass. Our next element is space, which defined by your text is the indefinable general receptacle of all things, the seemingly empty space around us. We will be looking at space in three dimensions, space in two dimensions, and implied depth. Of all of our visual elements that we'll be going over, space will probably be the most complicated to convey to you, the student. The way I'm communicating with you about the subject is through images, words, and audio. But to best understand three-dimensional space, we actually must be inside it. Even though we're surrounded by space every day, we get a better sense of it when we're inside a large building such as this North Terminal from the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. Even though architects are concerned with the design and the function of a structure or a building, an architect's primary concern is with space. Most early architects used to design most of their structures on paper, but the modern architect does have an advantage with 3D programs on the computer where they can get a better sense of space. Sometimes your ceiling can be a little bit low and you don't notice that until you've actually built your structure. When we're inside a building or a large structure, we experience it as volume because we're inside of it. When you're walking up to the outside of a building or a large structure, you are experiencing it as mass. Here is a representation of space in two dimensions in this ancient Egyptian wall painting. Up until the late 1300s, early 1400s, artists had an extremely difficult time in trying to represent three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional area, like as in a painting or a drawing. This painting is from a time when there really was no system for defining depth in a painting, but artists did their best in trying to explain it visually. The reason why the space in this image is very confusing is that there really is no three-dimensional accuracy in here, represented on a two-dimensional surface. We look at the pond, the pool from up above, but the trees are at the wrong angle on the side, kind of laying flat. Also, the person in the upper right-hand corner is in profile. This technically is completely inaccurate in real space. Artists did eventually come up with systems in which way to represent depth on a two-dimensional surface. Here we have four clues to spatial depth. To the far left, we have overlapping. 
To the left of center, we have overlapping and diminishing size. To the right of center, we have vertical placement. And to the far right, we have overlapping vertical placement and diminishing size. Which out of the four is the best way to represent diminishing size in space? This oil painting by Paul Cezanne titled Still Life with Apples from around 1890 uses all of the clues of spatial depth that we just viewed. Some of them may be more in a subtle fashion, but we have the overlap of the fruit. We have the overlap and diminishing size, although much more subtle here than in the diagram that we just looked at. We also have vertical placement, that is, if you look where the lemon and some of the other fruit are placed and some of the other objects in here, you can see that they're placed in various positions. And we also have overlap, vertical placement, and diminishing size, all kind of entwined into one, making this a good example of implied depth. It wasn't until the early Renaissance, the early 1400s, that a system for representing three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface was developed. And this is called linear perspective. Architects and painters of the era helped develop the system and we still use it today. I teach this to all of my drawing students. At the top we have one point linear perspective where you make a horizon which is your eye level and you put a vanishing point on that horizon line. You can draw lines going towards the vanishing point with your ruler, thus creating the illusion of space. The reason why we have a convincing illusion of space is that the objects appear to recede as they go off into the distance. In the center panel we still have one point linear perspective, but our line of sight is right at the uh, horizon line, it's at eye level, meaning that we should be able to see a objects above and below our horizon line. This is more complex than the image at the top because you do have to have a bottom and a top represented in this to be convincing with your illusion. The panel on the bottom is much more complex. It is two point linear perspective where we have two vanishing points on a horizon line. This is much more accurate to what we see and experience in everyday life. One form of linear perspective that's not represented here is a three-point linear perspective. It's pretty much the same as our two-point linear perspective where we have two vanishing points on a horizon line, but you would also have a third vanishing point that would be below the horizon line. If you're looking at the third panel on the bottom, it would be much more below the cube than you can even see in its defined rectangular space there. If you've ever flown in an airplane over a large city like New York or Chicago, you most likely have looked out the window and experienced something that looks akin to three-point perspective, where the buildings are really close to you on top, but they look so far away on the bottom. I pulled this particular image from a later lesson, the one about the Renaissance that's coming up later in the semester because this is the first fully realized painting of linear perspective that is correct. It is the Holy Trinity by Masaccio from around 1425 to 1428. It is a fresco which is a painting on plaster. We'll be discussing that further in our lesson about painting. The horizon line is below the base of the cross and there is a vanishing point in the center of it. All lines in this image recede to that point. So I just wanted to show you this first to reinforce what's coming later. Here's another linear perspective painting. This is the School of Athens by Raphael from 1508. It is also a one-point linear perspective painting just like Masaccio's Holy Trinity. That's the painting we just looked at before this one. The major difference with this is that the horizon line is in the center where our eye level is and we will see things above and below the horizon line in three dimensions. The vanishing point here is between the two men, or men at the center of the painting. There is a perspective mistake in here. If you look at the bottom 
there's a uh, man resting with his uh, head on his hand writing a note on top of a box kind of a block right there at the lower bottom that box looks visually off because it does not recede to the point of the vanishing point in the center it recedes off into another direction so in combination with everything else in here it just doesn't technically work we're going to see in some later paintings like the last supper by leonardo da vinci that the figures of most importance will be placed right by or on top of the vanishing point the two figures here in the center are actually plato and aristotle this is a line study of the school of athens by raphael here you can see the uh, diagram shows us the eye level where the horizon is in the center is the vanishing point and the lines that recede to that particular point if you look at the dotted lines it shows how that one box i was talking about is actually in two point perspective rather than one point perspective like the rest of the painting here's another study of the school of athens by raphael it just shows you what the space would look like if they take out all the figures and without all the confusion of the figures being in there you can really get a sense of the complexity of the space that Raphael created the last type of perspective we'll be looking at in this lesson is atmospheric perspective you can see it here in this painting by Asher Brown Durand this is kindred spirits from 1849 Atmospheric perspective is a non-linear means of creating an illusion of depth. There really is no vanishing point in this particular painting. The images or objects that are closest to us in this painting are painted with much more detail, brighter in color. As they get what would be further from us in view, the details disappear which is very similar to an actual effect of light in a real situation like this if we were looking outside in nature. Here's another representation of atmospheric perspective. This is a ink wash and watercolor painting titled Poet on a Mountaintop. Even though this particular painting is defined by much more simpler lines than what we looked at in the previous painting by Asher Brown Durand, it uses atmospheric perspective in the same manner. The mountains that are furthest from us are painted in a light wash. And the mountain and the man, the house, everything else, the trees that are closest to us are painted with darker outlines in ink. Notice also how there's less detail in the mountains in the di distance. Certainly helps with the illusion. The next elements we'll be going over are time and motion. We have subcategories underneath these. We have manipulated time, implied motion, and actual time. This image here is of a Aztec calendar stone. It's from 1479. The Aztecs believed, as well as certain other ancient cultures and current cultures, that time was cyclical in nature. For them, the world went through periodic cycles of destruction and recreation which is the idea behind the calendar stone here. At the center there's the sun god and he's surrounded by four rectangular compartments which represent uh, previous incarnations of the world. This painting is the meaning of Saint Anthony and Saint Paul from around 1440. This represents the Judeo-Christian concept of time which is linear the time is continuously moving forward. Time is made visible in this painting by showing St. Anthony at different points on his journey to meet St. Paul. You have him starting his journey in the upper left hand corner and in the upper right hand corner he meets a centaur and at the bottom of the painting you have him meeting St. Paul. The journey through space aspect of this is that in the upper left hand corner he's smallest over on the right hand side he's a little bit larger and at the bottom he's even larger than that showing a progression through space as well as time when it comes to comics time tends to be told in a linear fashion here we have a comic by Gary Panter this is back to nature from 2001 and time is made visible by a gradual progression in thoughts and reaction to the events of September 11th back in 2001 
Another fashion in which an artist can make time visible is through manipulating time. Any time you are working with film or video and you are editing, you are technically manipulating time to your advantage. Here we have an example of implied motion with this dancing Krishna bronze statue from the Kola dynasty around 1300. Here the artist skillfully balances the sculpture on one foot and its arms, legs, and body are posed as if it's caught in mid-motion. Artists have many ways of implying motion and here we have a drawing that does exactly that. This is Dynamism of a Human Body, Footballer, from Umberto Baccioni, made between 1913 and 1914. Baccioni was a part of a movement called the Futurist Movement that was very curious about things that go fast and motion. Now, film was starting at the same time. Cars were around, trains. Uh, not yet to the uh, airplane phase, but he actually starts to deal with that later on when that comes about. But... Here we have an aspect of a drawing that actually tries to cover all moments of this movement through time all at once in one single drawing. So rather than something that we watch sequentially like a film, uh, here we have all the movement and time of the playing of a soccer player in one drawn image. We can see implied motion in this untitled work by Jenny Holzer. She took light boards, which you normally see in advertising, and programmed sayings into them. The way the light boards are installed, it gives the impression to the viewer that the phrases are actually moving downwards, down the ramp, to the bottom of the gallery space. They of course are not moving. The lights are just programmed to come on in different locations, but it does give you the impression that it is moving, which again is implied motion. And finally, under time and motion, we have actual motion. Here are two different views of a mobile by Alexander Calder, untitled from 1976. Mobiles are so common today that most people probably take for granted that an artist actually came up with this idea. Even though Calder invented the mobile, artist Marcel Duchamp actually came up with the title mobile. These are kinetic sculptures. They have movement and they tend to move with the flow of the air so depending on the flow of the air it may move more uh, the less flow it'll move less moving on to our next element we have light light can be used as a medium but light also in general affects the way we see things light can be dull or bright and merely by pointing a light at an object and if you move to a different location you can completely change the way that object looks. So we'll be talking about the effects of light and light as a medium for art. This is a comparison of two photographs of the head of Abraham Lincoln from the Lincoln Memorial and you can see simply by redirecting the light how it can completely change how we perceive an object. On the left we can see how the memorial looks during normal daylight and how it originally looked after it was originally installed. Lights were eventually installed above the memorial to counter the effects of the daylight and give the majestic sculpture much more of a dramatic look. In this image we have an example of dark and light relationships. In art terms we call this value. It's the relative lightness or darkness of surfaces. The bar in the center is the same tone of gray but notice how the relationship of it changes as the background tones change. On the left side we have a lighter white gradually doing a gradient into the darker gray on the right hand side. It somehow seems that the bar is changing color a little bit but it isn't. It's an optical illusion. This is a drawing from the Renaissance period from Annabel Caracci. It's head of a youth. This is done in a style titled chiaroscuro which is shading basically from light to dark. The artist used neutral color paper, and for the dark areas, charcoal was used, and for the white highlights, chalk was used. The use of a neutral colored paper is advantageous because the white highlights stand out much better than if you were to do this on white paper and try to use varying tones of gray with your charcoal. It's just much more of a dramatic effect when used 
in this manner. The term chiaroscuro is originally Italian. It comes from combining two Italian words, chiaro meaning light and oscuro meaning dark. This painting here is titled Harvest Season and is by Rosa Bonheur and was made around 1859. When you're using chiaroscuro, you're usually trying to suggest some type of mass of the figures, objects, shapes, anything that's in your picture plane. And here we see the animals especially and the hay cart being treated very delicately with serious tones of uh, dark transitioning into light. A lot of times you see chiaroscuro being used in closed rooms with light entering the window. Here's a little bit of a different approach where it's outside but there is a lot of depth within the value of this image. This is a light installation titled Motordom from Keith Sonier from 2004 and it is an example of light as a medium. These neon tubes flicker on and off approximately every five minutes to give the impression as if tail lights are driving by. This effect is probably seen more when we look at the images of cars taken with photographs, but it's the same effect. You can read more about Keith Sonier and his work in the Forming Art section of Chapter 3 in your text. Here's another example of light as a medium. This is part of an installation titled The Seven Lights from Paul Chan. It ran from 2005 to 2007. Remember with an installation, things are just temporary. These impressions that the artist left behind only lasted as long as the installation did. He installed seven different projectors projecting seven different pieces that all were in length of about uh, 14 minutes. And in the title, he actually crossed out, put a line through the word lights, because the piece is actually more about the shadows. But remember, we cannot have shadows without light. The last element of art we're going to be going over in this lesson is color. Even though color is an element itself, it cannot exist without light. So we're still going to be talking about light in the context of color. The color of light waves has different properties. It acts differently from reflected light. Local color is the color of things. It's derived from light reflected from surfaces. Artists generally use reflected light in their work. The exception, of course, is when an artist uses light as a medium. Light is composed of color. According to our text, color is the effect on our eyes of light waves of differing wavelengths or frequencies. Newton discovered in 1666 that the visible parts of white light are composed of colors of the spectrum or rainbow. Colors also have different wavelengths of different speeds. Beyond the technical aspects of color, color may also have symbolic meaning and it can affect moods, thoughts, and your health. Here's an example of white light refracted by a prism. As you see, when white light enters a prism and exits on the opposite side, it presents all the colors of the color spectrum, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, and violet. So when we're talking about pigments and light, paint does not act like light waves. Light waves mix equals additive colors, meaning mix all light waves together, it equals white light. Remove all light waves, it equals black, total darkness. But with paints, when we mix them all together, it equals subtractive colors. Subtract all paints to get white. Mix all paints to get black. This here is a color wheel. I'm sure some of you have had some experience with this in your schooling past. When we speak of color, color is broken up into three general components, which is hue, which is basically the name of the color, value, which is the relative lightness or darkness of the color, and intensity, which is also called sometimes saturation, kind of the brightness, the intensity of a color. When you look at the chart, the colors have numbers under each of them in the center of the dial, so to say. We have ones, twos, and threes. The ones represent primary colors, the twos represent secondary colors, 
and the threes represent intermediate or tertiary colors. Our primary colors are our colors in its purest form. Nothing can be mixed to get these colors. These are directly kind of the lights, think about it, that we get from the prism. Our primary colors are yellow, blue, and red. Next we have our secondary colors which we get when we mix our primary colors together. So uh, when we mix yellow and blue we get green, when we mix blue and red we get violet, and when we mix yellow and red we get orange. With our intermediate colors they are a mixture of our secondary colors and our primaries. So when we mix yellow and green we get yellow green, when we mix green and blue we get blue green, blue and violet we get blue violet, red and violet we get red violet, red and orange we get red orange, and orange and yellow we get yellow orange. So we were just looking at our hues as a component of color. Here we have our value scale from white to black. So this is basically a sliding scale of white to black, light to dark, with varying grays in the center. This is a value scale with a variation in red. This is just an example of a color and a value mixture on a sliding scale. Our third variable of color is intensity. This is an example of from bright to dull. You can dull your hues by adding either uh, something in the value range like white, black, or gray, or you can do a mixture of another color to try to dull it down. In the same sense, sometimes mixing colors together will add intensity. It just comes through experimentation. So to further reinforce what we've been talking about in reference to color, this is uh, our pigment primaries, our red, yellow, and blue. This is a subtractive color mixture, which means we are mixing paint basically. This is what happens when they all lay on top of each other. And this is an example of our additive color mixture when we're projecting light and what happens when they all combine with each other. As you see in the center where they all overlap we have white. Also under color within art we have color temperature. This is the varying warmth or coolness of a color. A red, for example, is what you would call a warm color, and a blue is an example of cool colors. We're still going to talk about color, but now in the context of printing. This is a color printing detail of Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Printing usually uh, varies from printer to printer. We have printers that are RGB, standing for red, green, and blue, and we also have CMYK printers. The printers you may have at home are usually a uh, RGB printer with a separate black but then the fancier ones you can get like from Epson and Canon may have multiple different types of color within them and the varying different types of combinations of them will give you a common color result. When I brought up uh, CMYK it's a different variation of color. You have slight variations off of main colors uh, like cyan is a variation of blue, magenta is a variation of red, and those are combined with yellow and black to get a full color spectrum result. This actually provides a little bit higher quality than your standard RGB printer. These next several slides are examples of what a color print would look like in its separate entities as in the yellows, the cyans, blues, magentas, and such. So here is an example of what the yellow would look like. Here is our magenta tone. This is yellow and magenta combined. This is cyan. Yellow, magenta, and cyan combined. And finally our black, which is usually the last color that goes on. And here's a mixture of yellow, magenta, cyan, and black, which is your highest quality printing. Many artists and designers that work in the computer realm, this also includes web designers, may choose their colors from color palettes such as this. This is an example of red, blue, and green color palettes from GIMP, Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, many of these other programs that exist for digital artists also have color palettes such as these to choose your colors from.
colors also break down into color schemes. We're now going to be looking at uh, three different color schemes. This is our first example, which is monochromatic color. The previous slide was an example of monochromatic color. In this slide, we have another color scheme, which is called analogous color. Analogous colors are located adjacent to one another on the color wheel. This image is titled Trio. It's by Jennifer Bartlett from 2008. It's enamel over silkscreen grid on baked enamel steel plates. And when it's fully exhibited, it's 63 inches by 27 feet. So this is an example of analogous color that's not necessarily a painting. It's an installation of all these steel plates that are mounted all together. Complementary colors are colors that are directly opposite of each other on the color wheel. The image we are looking at is from Keith Haring. Just a little tidbit of information. Keith Haring was probably the one who started the graffiti art movement from being taken out of the subways in New York and taken seriously in the galleries today. He led to um, the acceptance of Jean-Michel Basquiat, who we'll look at later, and also the current graffiti artist, Banksy. Complementary colors are colors that are directly opposite of each other on the color wheel. The last visual element for this lesson is texture. Texture refers to the tactile qualities of surfaces or the visual representation of those qualities. We can have actual texture and implied texture. The first image we'll be looking at covering texture as a visual element is Object or Breakfast in Fur by Merritt Oppenheim from 1936. This is a teacup and saucer and spoon wrapped in fur. Now when we're just looking at the tactile qualities, this is actual texture that you can feel when you touch it. Uh, beyond that, this is part of the surrealist movement that she worked in and the juxtaposition of two things that are very contradictory, meaning something that you would drink out of and then having it covered in fur serves as that irony, that off-putting sensibility that is a big part of what the surrealist movement was all about. This image here is of a stoneware flask from the Tang Dynasty in China, circa 9th century. Now this has both aspects of what we're covering with texture, which is there's some implied texture, just simply by the way it looks on top of the surface. There are two different glazes on top of the stoneware. Stoneware itself does actually have some actual texture to it that it feels a little bit rough to the fingers. Here, having the little speckled kind of potted marks does give the appearance of some type of rough surface. Actually, there is a chemical process when the two glazes are combined, and there is physical texture when you touch it. It's got kind of a rough potted surface. This slide here is a detail of the Starry Night from Vincent van Gogh, made in 1889. It is oil paint on canvas. When an artist uses oil paint and layers it and layers it and layers it to where it becomes very thick, that is called impasto. If you were to go to some of Vincent van Gogh's paintings, maybe not necessarily this one, but if you look at the upper right-hand corner where we have the uh, moon in the sky, some of those areas, they're actually casting shadows from the light, so you can actually see the thickness of it on the surface. There is a rumor, although I don't know who actually gets to touch the surface of a Vincent van Gogh painting, but they say the oil paint is so thick it's formed a skin, and that on the inside of this skin, that some of the paint still hasn't dried yet. Now, when we look at Vincent van Gogh's work, there is an aspect that it looks visually textured, but since the impasto is used in his technique, this also would have a tactile quality when you're rubbing your hand across the surface. But this isn't necessarily meant to represent any type of texture. This is something that he created in the context of this work. The slide here is the last slide we'll be covering under the texture portion of the visual elements. It's also the last slide for lesson three. This is a detail of the Arnolfini portrait by Jan van Eyck 
made in 1434. It is oil paint on oak. This is implied texture, but maybe in a much more subtle way. And we only have a very, very small portion of this painting. This is riddled with different textures from the clothing. There's actually a dog at their feet. Uh, we will be looking at this painting later on in the semester. By layering oil paint in glazes, you can get a variety of different textures. Jan van Eyck was the master of texture and influenced everybody that came after him, especially during the uh, Renaissance. Now we have the reflective quality of the mirror, the wood grains, the texture of the wall, and when you aren't even really seeing is the texture of the clothing from felt to furs and other things. This was a very, very skilled use of oil paint and giving us a different type of implied texture that it looks like a photograph, but he's implying all these actual textures that really do exist. This brings to a close Lesson 3. I hope you enjoyed it.